Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson at Strahd in San Jose. I'm here with Terrence Spees. Terrence, how you doing? Hi, great. Nice to be here. So you're with Voltage Security. That's right. And can you give us a brief explanation of what is Voltage Security? Yeah, so we're a spin out of Stanford University. We started in uh, 2002 with a uh, technology that was developed at the computer science department there called something called identity-based encryption, which is really an innovation around making public key cryptography easier to use in terms of eliminating certificates. That evolved into a mail and file uh, tool that we had shipped for a long time to enterprise customers for communication outside the boundaries. Then we noticed in sort of 2006, 2007 that lots of these companies were running into issues with internal databases and maintaining credit card data and things within those. It was really kind of the beginning of the data breach era. Um, and so we started thinking, are, are there solutions to this problem to enable people to store data in a more secure way? And came up with this idea of something called format preserving encryption, which is basically using existing cryptographic tools to do what we call kind of de-identification of data, where rather than just on mass encrypting data, you're taking that data and you're picking very specific properties that you want to maintain for analytic purposes, but essentially randomizing the rest of that data. So you might, for example, take a credit card number database and use format preserving encryption to encrypt that database so they look like credit card numbers, but they have no value to an attacker. And then the, the advent of the, the big data sort of era that we're, we're uh, involved in here, um, that adds a, a lot of value to those kinds of contexts where you're looking to collect a lot of data perform analytics on those data, but you don't want to expose yourself to the risk of as, as suddenly I have a terabyte of credit card uh, numbers inside of this thousand node Hadoop cluster, right? So is, is data nowadays different? Um, you know, it, look back 10, 15 years ago and there were PCs everywhere, right. and some of them were secure and some of them weren't, and some of them no one cared about breaking into, so they were secure. <laughs> right. But, was that PC era different, more secure or less secure than, like, let's say, Hadoop clusters and everything being cloud-based? Well, so I would say it was definitely less secure in terms of, if you talk to the security community, you know, a lot of people in the security community would have thought of themselves as almost sort of hopelessly naive about 20 years ago, right? You look at the, the level of attacks that people were worried about, and they were pretty primitive compared to the sort of timing attacks or, you know, people listening across power buses and things like that. So we've definitely improved in, the, in terms of the way that we can think about security and the tools that we have available to us. But on the counterpoint to that, we're now much more connected and also much more dense in terms of the value of the things that we're storing, right? So back in the PC era, you know, you floppy disks and, and 10 megabyte hard drives, the, the opportunity to an attacker was pretty limited. Now you've got, you know, I, I see an, an HP box over there with 81 terabytes worth of storage in a single blade, and it's like, for an attacker, th these are gold mines of data in terms of, one, those things are much more connected, two, the data that's in there tends to be much more value than may have been in the, in the PC era. Um, and the, the processing is just much more complicated. So security's definitely had to evolve. So I'd say we were definitely, in some absolute sense, less secure previously, but there's just a lot more value, which has forced all of the people in the security industry to really up their game and become much more professional about thinking about, one, how to make this stuff palatable to, to people that are implementing these systems, um, but also just to keep up with the pace of attacks that are. So if you were to give advice to, let's say, a, a CTO or CIO, Let's say of like someone like Sony mm -hmm. and how they can make themselves more secure and their data and their customer records, their email, everything about their data platform right. to make it more secure. What approach should they start with first? I mean, how do they get more secure? Right. So uh, security is like fitness. It's it's not something that you achieve, it's something that you have to work into your lifestyle, right? I mean, right. it's not like you're you're going to get fit and you're done in the same way you're not going to get secure and you're done, right? It has to be part of something that you do every day in the way that you kind of think about your business, right? So the internet and, and big data and all these technology tools have given all of these companies a, an enormous boost to their business model and new ways to think about customers and doing, doing transactions, but also has basically made security a mandatory thing that they have to think about all of the time, right? So, and, and we see this evolution in terms of when we would talk to customers about cryptography before, it was a relatively kind of niche kind of thing and we'd you know, be ushered into the basement where we'd talk to the security guys in the IT department. Now with you know data breaches, that, that there, there's been a lot more awareness in the executive suite that the security has to be sort of a core mission statement kind of thing for a company. So, um, and that means not just saying, okay, I'm gonna get to the level that I'm secure and be done. It means you always have to be asking those questions. Right? What data am I storing? 
uh, how much risk am I, do I uh, incur because of that data, and what are my strategies around protecting that data, right? Regardless of, of platforms that are coming in, because basically there's always going to be new platforms, uh, mobile and, and and big data, and as, as things things evolve, you're going to be storing these data, this data, and processing this data in increasingly new ways, which means that you always have to be asking that that question of, okay, what am I storing that's potentially going to lead to unpleasant conversations with the press or, or regulatory uh, kinds of issues, and what am I doing to avoid or, or mitigate those issues? So you mentioned de-identification earlier, too. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that done you know, early in a data you know, acquisition of a name or a customer record? Is that de-authentication, de-identification? Done early on, or when is it? Done? Ideally, it's done when it when it hits right away. So the payment industry, because it's been hit so hard, um, has really organized in, a, in a, uh, a pretty profound kind of way. So there's something called PCI, the payment card industry, that has set a set of standards called DSS around data security for basically how credit card numbers have to be treated. Because up until you know the, the mid 2000s, when you swiped your credit card number at a terminal, basically that was almost always plain text all the way back to the processor. Right? Kind of yeah. kind of shocking. Yeah. So PCI basically said. Let this just has this has to change, right? So they set a set of standards that said basically that data has to be encrypted when it hits the mag stripe all the way back. And so you want that data sort of de-identified or encrypted basically all the way back into the infrastructure. And then the de-identification, you know, one of the things that Voltage does is supply you with data identification that can be done when you're storing that data itself in terms of stop storing the credit card number and basically pick the properties you're going to need for your analytic environment, retain those properties, and de-identify the rest of it. So if some intruder comes in and penetrates an application, what they take out is not going to be any value to them, right? You're retaining some amount of the analytic value in the actual protected form of the data, so you don't have to keep decrypting and, 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 and re-encrypting it. Um, so you've got that value, but the, the, the value to the attacker has, has been removed. So you're, you're talking about the application layer, so you guys are sitting right. at the top of the stack. Right. And are you working with things like Falcon and Hive, or do you guys, yeah. uh, are you aware of those projects? Sure, so we, we see the Hadoop infrastructure evolving to incorporate encryption at, at multiple layers of the stack. So one of the you see is, for example, transparent HDFS encryption um, has started becoming part of the technology previews of, of a lot of the distributions in terms of you can set an encryption point uh, within the HDFS directory and it will basically encrypt the files in and then you can set an access control list. We're actually integrating our key management strategy around providing capabilities at that layer. Um, as column level encryption starts becoming a feature of, of, of Falcon and Hive, basically we're looking at uh, incorporation there, but we see uh, people that have particularly regulatory uh, relevant data in terms of PCI data or healthcare data, that they're going to have encryption solutions potentially at, at all the layers of the stack in terms of they're going to be encrypting the volume to protect one set of attacks, uh, encrypting the column, and then doing things like format preserving encryption at the very top level to de-identify that data or tokenize that data so that the removal at the application layer is not going to yield a, a useful to the attack. So if, if you were to say one thing to a CIO about moving to a more secure data world, what, what advice would you give them on how to get going? Yeah, so our, our first piece of advice is almost always that you have to have an inventory of what are you actually storing and, and what do you need to store, right? So lots of these large enterprises have, have grown through acquisition or they have uh, applications that have been running for years and years and it can be a shock to them in terms of, oh, I've got this database that contains all of my customer data and I've got two applications that access it. And then they go and they do, well, it turns out there's 600 applications that have grown and accreted over time to do this. And what, what you can then do once you have that inventory is start deriving strategies around how do I want to protect that data? How do I want to uh, e either perform things like de-identification or do I want to use infrastructure tools to protect it? Or in some cases, do I just want to get rid of the data altogether? Yeah. Um, because you, you have to keep doing those inventories because it's really hard to delete data, right? I mean, everybody, uh, it's really easy to store stuff, and, and once you store it, it starts getting backed up, it starts getting replicated on other platforms, people fire up Excel and take snapshots out of, uh, out of databases and store them as files. It just propagates everywhere. Once data is in the infrastructure, it's really hard to erase. <laughs> so what you need to do is understand sort of how you're collecting that stuff, who has access to it, and, and what you're keeping, and basically get pretty aggressive about removing or de-identifying the data that, that, that's going to be relevant in some way, shape, or form, either in terms of you know, in the case of Sony, you know, customer or business partner uh, kind of reputation, or in the case of a, a payment provider or someone in the healthcare space, we've actually got explicit sort of audit, uh, audit and regulatory requirements about how that data has to be handled. 
So, Terrence, if we were to sit down, this, and this will be my last question for us, but if we were to sit down 12 months from now, next year at Strata San Jose, right. what would you say would be the biggest thing that Voltage has done in that 12 months that are ahead of us? Um, so if you look at what we're doing with customers right now, a lot of it is, is about very comprehensive programs to say basically, if I have a credit card number and I'm storing it, I'm just never going to store it in plain text, right? It's always going to be stored in a de-identified context, and if I'm going to re-identify that data in some way, it's going to be in a very limited kind of thing. So what we're really about is, is about getting encryption moved from a kind of, you know, uh, voodoo black magic kind of technology into a more ubiquitous kind of enterprise utility in the same way that people think of databases or um, uh, Wi-Fi or networking services as something that, that, that you know, gets provided as kind of an IT utility. Encryption should sort of be the same way in terms of there's an encryption strategy, you understand how you're going to treat that data and you understand that there's a set of tools you can provide to developers that don't require them to understand key strengths and algorithms and things like that. There's just a simple strategy to say basically this data is going to be de-identified when you store it, here's how you're going to do that. That just becomes part of the culture that enables you to, to keep control over that data that you are retaining within the organization. Excellent. We we'll look forward to seeing you next okay. year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.